question. All right, welcome back to Biblical Manhood. Today, we're going to continue on with the next Bible study with 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 1 through 13 from the video series from Robert Breaker. Let's get into it. To our online Bible study, verse by verse, through the books of Paul. Okay. And we're starting in order of when the books were written. So our first book is the book of 1 Thessalonians. And we're starting in chapter 3. We've been through the first two chapters, so now we're starting in chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians. So let's begin. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. And then this verse continues in verse 2, but it begins with the word wherefore. What does it mean, wherefore? Well, it's a continuation of the thought that we read in chapter 2. So what happened in chapter 2? Well, verse 14, we see that the Jews persecuted Paul. In chapter, I mean, in verse 18, we find that Satan hindered Paul. And if you're in the ministry and you're trying to do the work of the Lord, you will see that Satan tries to hinder a lot. He does not like people preaching the gospel. So there were a lot of things that Paul said he went through. And so he says, but... Because of all that, wherefore, so in summary, besides everything that happened in chapter 1, verse 2. So we'd do good to go back and read verse one, or chapter 1 and 2 again, if you would. But chapter 2 ends with, where is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? So Paul is saying that even though I went through all that suffering, all that persecution, all that bad stuff, hey, it was all worth it to see you saved, to see people saved. So... That's one thing we should try to focus on is soul winning. And that's something we should try to do is win people to Jesus Christ. Now, all we can do is show them the scripture. Soul winning. KGV clan tagging called. Is wise. Well, in a way, we win them because we come to them. But why should we give ourselves the glory? Here's the problem with soul winning. Most people do it just to brag on themselves. I've met many, many people that talk about, well, I won this guy the Lord, and I won that guy, and I won, and I, I, I. If you're continually saying, I, 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 then you've got a problem. The Bible says, humble yourselves. I've been to many churches. I've been out with many people, soul winning, and I've seen a lot of things that are just really sad. And if you're going to try to win people just so you can brag on yourself, that's a problem. When the Apostle Paul won people to the Lord, he actually wrote letters to them. That's what Thessalonians is, writing letters to his converts. He actually communed with them and taught them and did things for them. Most people nowadays that claim to be soul winners, they just go out, they take their Bible, they show a person three or four verses, and then they say, repeat after me. And then they say, That's okay, sad. Save by and walk away. You never see that person again. That person never gets in church. I don't see how that's true soul winning according to the Bible. So what makes true soul winning? Well, we will see from the next verse that it all hinges on the gospel. You are not soul winning unless you're preaching the gospel. What is the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. So unless you're preaching this, you're not doing this. I've been out with a lot of people before, and they all like to follow the Romans road. Like one, um, one missionary said, the Romans road leads to Rome, and Rome will lead you to hell. I know what he meant. Maybe you don't, you know, because a lot of people, oh, Romans Road, that's great. I'm not against you using verses, but what I am against is not giving people the gospel. And the Romans Road to this day has become a method that has been so whittled down that it's just three or four, ver three or four verses. And the last verse is Romans 10, 13. And they say, you see that word call, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now just repeat this prayer after me. Do you know it's very easy to get people to repeat prayers? Especially with children. A child will repeat any prayer you tell them to. Just because someone says something with the mouth doesn't mean they're saved. According to the Bible, the calling has to come from the heart. It is therefore faith. Now let's look at that. And this is all going to tie in with verse 2. I guess I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But look, 2 Timothy 2.22, let's look at that. 2 Timothy 2.22. 2 Timothy 2.22. Do thou okay. useful us, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, peace, with them that call on the Lord, and then it says, out of a pure heart. 
what most people today who claim to be soul winners are doing are giving people about four verses and say, read these, and then they say, now with your mouth, just call on God and say, oh God, please save me. And they are omitting the preaching of the gospel because they won't take them to this passage. Why go the Romans road? Why not the First Corinthians road? And they will not tell a person, now you have to believe from the heart. So all the emphasis is on the mouth. And modern day soul winning in many churches has become a thing where people go do it to brag upon themselves. And all they do is get people to repeat a worthless religious prayer. And then they brag, hey, I want somebody else. Hey, I want somebody else. But where are those people that you want? They never darken the door of a church. You never see them again. Where are they? When Paul won people to the Lord, they continued on in the faith. How come these people supposedly get saved? Let me give you an example. I've got hundreds of them. But I was out visiting in Pensacola, Florida with a partner one time. And my partner was following the modern Romans road. And he said, hey man, are you, can I give you some Bible verses? Can I talk to you? And the guy opened the door, but he had his hand behind the door. And he wouldn't bring his hand out. And that was kind of scary. I'm saying, he's got a gun back there. So what's he going to do? <laughs> Good pastor. Then. Four verses is all he gave him. And then I said, now repeat this prayer after me. And the guy goes, will it make you go away? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, okay. He repeated the prayer. He says, well, man, praise God, now you're saved. And the guy said, that's great. And he pulled a, what he was hiding behind the door was a beer. And he pulled the beer out. And he says, now, are you guys done? Because i got a party to get back to here. And he says, wait. And he says, now, get out of here and slam the door. But you know what? That's not the worst part. The worst part was my partner went away and told people, I won one person to the Lord today. Yeah! Do you really believe that he won somebody to Jesus Christ? I don't believe so for a second. That poor lost soul just wanted us to leave. He'd do anything we asked just to go away so he could get back to his party, to his sinning, to his doing evil. But many people are such shallow soul winners nowadays that they don't, they don't see the situation for what it is. They don't see the person as they are. They don't take the person to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, so they're omitting the gospel. Then the emphasis is on the mouth. And it's very easy for a person to repeat a prayer and still be lost and still go to hell. See that in the Catholic Church a lot. Understood or accepted the gospel. Now with that stated, back to 1 Thessalonians, I want to do things the way Paul did. I want to do things the way the Bible does. I don't want to do it the modern way. I've heard so many stories lately of false soul winning where people just, well, there's one famous preacher. If I mention his name, you probably know exactly who he was. And this famous preacher said that he won a man to the Lord going down an elevator a few floors. How do you, you get in an elevator, you go down three floors, and you get out. Is that enough time to win somebody to Jesus Christ? Well, he claimed that he did. He's a famous preacher, brags that he has the biggest church in the world. And um, he's dead now. He's passed away. But do you think that's even possible? What did he do? He told him, he said, hey, man, are you a sinner? He said, yep. He said, uh, you want to go to heaven? He said, yep. He said, you believe in God? And the sinner said, yep. He goes, repeat after me. Oh, God, I'm a sinner. Please say me amen. And he said the guy did. And he said he went him to the Lord going down the floor. Do you believe that? That's possible a guy heard the gospel somewhere before. That's possible. But that came from the mouth, his prayer. And it was a vain religious repeating of prayer. How do we know he meant it from the heart? We don't. Even if he meant it. Was he trusting in Jesus, or was he trusting in the prayer? You see, that's the problem with the world today. Jesus Christ is our propitiation. Propitiation. All right? Instead of pointing people to the propitiation, to Jesus Christ on the cross, and saying, he paid for your sins, trust in what he's done for you. If you trust what he's done, then you're saved. Most soul winners today... Go to a person's house, pick a few verses, out of context by the way, and then say, now repeat this prayer. So they turn the gospel from trusting in what Jesus has done for the sinner into instructing the sinner to do something with the lips. Mm. Now do this prayer. Say this prayer. Do this. And a lot of people end up trusting in the prayer they said rather than trusting in what Jesus Christ did. 
in the blood that he shed. That's the problem with soul winning today. Now, back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. So they were waiting and forbearing. What does forbear mean? It was to wait. Well, they were waiting for something. What were they waiting for? Well, this is found in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. So let's go there real briefly. And I want to get to verse 2 is where I'm trying to get us. So Acts chapter 17. And in Acts 17 verses 14 and 15, this is literally what Paul is talking about. Then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea, but Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him into Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now what happened in Athens? Well, the rest of that chapter goes on to tell you that there were lost religious people in Athens that were worshiping idols. And Paul had some idol time, I-D-L-E, not I-D-O-L. And he walked around and he looked at all their statues of all their gods. And he just shook his head and said, where is the Lord Jesus Christ? And so then Paul stood up on Mars Hill, which was the main place in Athens where people that had something to say could speak. And he says, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. And Paul says, verse 23, I passed by and beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. And Paul began to preach unto them the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul, when he saw lost people, he saw, okay, what his mind was, what are they thinking? What do they believe? Why do they believe it? How can I show them the truth, the gospel, in such a way that where they're coming from, they could understand it? That's what's missing in modern day soul winning. People are instructed, go out with the Romans road, show people four verses, have them repeat a prayer after you, and if they repeat the prayer, then they're saved. Are they saved? How do you know what's happening in the heart? How do you know if they're trusting in the propitiation or if they end up trusting in their prayer? There's countless millions of people out there who end up trusting in a prayer rather than trusting in Christ. I just watched a good video that showed the truth about this purpose-driven church stuff by this Warren man. And the purpose-driven church is a way to take over a church. And it basically turns the church into a country club. It kicks out the preaching of the gospel. It turns it into a rock band group, uh, entertainment style of, of a church building. But what it does to soul winning is completely shadow soul winning. Because in the purpose-driven churches, it's all about the social networking, the social gospel. It's all about the carnal needs not the spiritual needs. And so that's one of the reasons why modern churches today are not soul winning correctly. So it's exactly. important that when we go out and win souls, we try to take the gospel. We can show them other verses, but this is where it says this is the gospel. Why not show them the passage that says this is the gospel and explains it better than any other passage in the Bible that Jesus is the way to heaven, trusting in what he did. This purpose-driven stuff, they tell you just to follow Jesus. Just to make up in your mind and say, well, from now on, I'm just going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow his teaching. So people become a follower of Jesus, but they never truly believed in Jesus and what he's done on the cross. So then you have people like the Jesus freaks. The Jesus freaks who go around and, oh, man, we love Jesus, man. Long-haired hippie smoking dope. They're just following the teachings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They've never come any farther in the Bible to see that Jesus was the propitiation for all mankind. He paid for their sins. And you don't follow him. You trust him as your savior. You can decide to follow Jesus. And go to hell. But until you trust him. You're not saved. After you trust him. You pick up your cross. After you trust him. You can follow Jesus. But we must come through the word of God. Through the gospel. So in chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians. Wherefore when we can no longer forbear. We thought it good to be left at Athens alone. And sent Timotheus, our brother, and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Now, do you remember in um, chapter 2, I believe it was, how often, and even in chapter 1, Paul would say three things. We talked about how it was like a homiletical outline. Paul would always mention three different things. Well, he does it again here in chapter 3. And he says, our brother, our minister, and our fellow laborer. 
So Paul says about Timotheus, our brother, our fellow laborer. And what is the other thing he says? And our minister. Well, minister is number two, but I'll put it down here. I don't have to erase it. So he says, our minister, our fellow laborer, in what? In the gospel. So all these came through the gospel. So what does that mean? That means you're only saved through the gospel. So why would you ever go soul winning without giving the gospel? Why would you take them another way, Romans Road? Why would you say, follow this method instead of following the biblical method of salvation through the gospel, preaching of the gospel? He was the fellow laborer and minister. So what was he ministering? The gospel. So when he would go, he'd say, look, let me tell you what the gospel is. He would tell them what 1 Corinthians 15 says, that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to Scripture. He was a fellow laborer. Our label, labor should be in the gospel. Many, many churches today don't even know what the gospel is. All they've been taught is, give four verses from the Romans Road and then tell someone to repeat the prayer after you. Hey, I'm not saying people don't get saved. It's possible. A lot of people can get saved, but they have to hear the gospel first. So when did they hear the gospel? That's what it all boils down to. I can use some words, uh, some verses out of Romans Road. Sometimes I do. I'll use Romans 10. Sometimes I'll go to Romans chapter 3 and say all of sin and come short of the glory of God. But I always take a sinner to 1 Corinthians 15. Amen. Hey, 1 Corinthians 15. Crazy. The world is so wicked. The world is so religious. That I've talked with other people, and they've all come to the agreement. They said, you know, I don't, I don't see how you can talk to someone about God and, and the Bible and salvation and lead them to the Lord without talking to them for at least 30 minutes, is what they tell me. <laughs> One guy said, I don't think you could lead someone to the Lord in under an hour's time. I don't know. But here's what happens. You go to a lot of lost people nowadays. They're in church, many of them. And they've been indoctrinated and taught a different way other than the true way. So it's almost a deprogramming session. You have to talk them out of what they've been talked into before you can tell them what the truth is for them to believe. So it is harder nowadays to reach people. Paul was going to lost pagans. He just gave them the gospel. Nowadays you have to go to people that are religious lost people and say, Look, I hate to say it, but what you believe is wrong. Let me show you some Bible verses. And then when you can show them they're wrong, then they've got to come to the point where they'll reject that and then understand what's right so they can be saved. It's crazy. I don't know. A guy can get... We talked about this before, how when you're trying to instill new, a new paradigm shift, you need to destroy their current one. Because, exactly. a lot of, because a lot of individuals have their reality built on beliefs which have no pillars to stand on but it's just there because someone told them which but the way you attack is you actually ask them you actually what i like to do is if someone has an opposing view to me and i know based on research that i'm right i still come from a point of let me learn from you why am i wrong i want to learn from you and when you ask them questions deep enough they'll realize oh i actually i actually don't know so they're, they're like, okay, so that's wrong, what I know, what is right. And then that's where you can instill new ideas. You don't have to push like the way Paul was. Paul came to the pagans. He knew there were uh, the believers and they believed in God, things like that. So he came and he was like, I, I know already that you believed in the unknown God. I'm here to present you the unknown God. Paul was very wise fortunate yeah like with what robert breaker said there about the past about the um, religious people you got to talk you got to kind of make them realize what they believe is wrong they have to unlearn so i remember a few days back uh saturday I was with my grandmother and as well as telling alex before went to a catholic church even though i'm not catholic just out of curiosity didn't take the sacraments i just you know sat there and listened and obviously it's in polish i couldn't understand but what i was told later is at the end the priest with like the money basket he said jesus take this money 
as remission for our sins because they believe in works. And it makes you wonder, do, does anyone there even read the Bible? If you, re if you are a Bible-believing Christian, you truly understand the gospel. That right there is spitting in the face of Christ. Imagine that. A church, which is supposed to be where people should know the Bible, they should know God, they have zero clue. Isn't that sad? And that's just not one place. That's happening everywhere. Because they're religious. They're not, they don't have a relationship with God. That's why God came down as Christ, so he could relate to us. Because people are so prideful and stubborn that, yeah, maybe if you come down as a person and he humbled himself to be by our side, people would go, well, you know what? He actually does love us. I'm going to trust in him. But people still want to believe, oh, here's, here's my money. I'll get myself into heaven. That is insulting to God. Yeah. yeah. In one minute, but that means he's had some seeds planted. But you're never going to lead someone to the Lord who has never heard or understand the gospel. And we looked at that a couple Sundays ago. On the preaching tape there on uh, on the preaching video about the three steps of salvation um, you've got to hear understand and then believe so see hear and understand and then believe so this is important right here and Paul is even saying it these were thy brothers fellow laborers and ministers in the gospel and what we're seeing today is less and less people preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ I've been to said it before and I'll say it again I've been to over 200 churches and I like to ask, who here can tell me where in the, in the Bible is the gospel? Only about five to ten times that I can remember has anyone ever said, oh, that's easy, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Nope. Most of the time it's, well, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, those are called gospels, but those aren't the gospel. So get back to preaching the gospel. Back to um, chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians. And sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. So when you believe and when you're saved, you need to be established. What does that mean? Well, that means you need to be checked on and made sure that you really are saved. There's people out there today that say you should never ask someone if they're saved or not. That's ridiculous. There's others that say, yeah, you can ask people if they're saved, but you should never pressure somebody and... And, 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 and try to get, get them to tell you their testimony because it might make them doubt their salvation. Let's go look at what Paul did. There's a lot of people out there that say, oh, you know, you can doubt your salvation and, and you shouldn't, uh, you know, be hard on people and ask them their testimony because you might make them doubt their salvation. Really? Really? Let's see what Paul says about that. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. I think it's great to ask anybody their testimony. When I meet someone and they claim to be a Christian, the first thing I say is, well, what's your testimony? And if their testimony doesn't line up with the Bible, I'll say, well, so where's that in the Bible? And if they say, well, uh, I'm not trying to make somebody feel bad. I want them to know the gospel and believe the gospel. And if they're not, I'm supposed to be instructing them, establishing them, and making sure that they are believing the truth. I had a time, one time I... Um, we had a couple missionaries over here to the house, and we all sat down and ate, and my dad asked one of the missionaries, he says, um, hey man, what's your testimony? And he went on and on for probably 20 minutes talking about, well, and then this happened, and then that, and then this, and, and everything, and he got done, and my dad just looked at him. And I looked at him, and he looked at my dad, and my dad looked at him, and, and this missionary goes, what? <laughs> I don't know if his conscience was, was dealing with him or what, but my dad goes, What'd you leave out? And he looked down and he thought, and he goes, you know what, I left out the gospel and I left out the blood, didn't I? My dad goes, yep. My dad said, when did you hear the gospel? When did you believe it? When did you understand it? When did you trust the blood? And that missionary was saved, but it was interesting that he told his testimony, but he didn't think to tell exactly biblically, you know, when that happened. A lot of people tell testimonies, they don't know what a testimony is. When you tell a testimony of salvation, that means tell me how you got saved. Tell me what you're trusting in to get you to heaven. And tell me how God brought you the gospel to hear so you could understand and believe. Yeah, and what we see today is there's videos out there with millions of views. There's a bunch of them on my testimony. And Christian and I would like watch them together. 
or we're talking about they they're missing the gospel they don't even know what they're 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 saying they got saved based on works based on baptism based on this or that so it's a false testimony which is yeah yeah they never talk about there's no mention of i knew i was a sinner i was sitting there and i recognized what christ did for me they don't talk like that you know never mentioned the blood never talked about they always talk about like works and baptism oh, i got baptized and I got saved yeah yeah exactly i had a um a cousin-in-law i guess you would call him one time i tried to witness to him and he was driving me from one place to another and we never got to talk so we're in the car and it was about a 45 minute drive and i said hey man i said randy tell me how you got saved and so he went on and on and he was a pilot and he told me this long story about he was flying in these high winds and so scared and it, he just went all into detail about this flying and he finally landed the plane but he had to hold it way over while the wind was blowing and everything and then we got right to the place where i had to get out and he said and that's how god saved me and i said randall um it sounds like you're thinking of spiritual, not spiritual salvation, but physical salvation. Yeah, God physically saved your life that day from dying. But when did you get saved from hell? And his face just turned. And he looked at me and said, I got to go. Bye. And drove off. So there are people that you ask them for their testimony. It's a good thing to do because they might not be saved. And they might even know what you're asking. He thought, when you get saved, meant when did God save you from dying literally in the flesh? No, I meant when did you get saved spiritually? He hadn't. So is it okay to ask people if they're saved? Some people say, no, no, you don't want people to doubt their salvation. Don't bother them. If they're saved, that's between them and God. You leave them alone. No. Paul it's the red flags of Christianity. Ask people if they're saved. Look at 2 Corinthians, chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. This is the Apostle Paul. <laughs> Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. He's writing to so-called Christians in 1 Corinthians. He says, examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. See if you're even saved. You know, another place he said in Galatians, I stand in doubt of you. He said, I doubt you're even saved. I wonder about you by the way you're doing things. But he says, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? So Paul says, make sure you're saved. If you're not, you're a bunch of reprobates. You're lost and on your way to hell. You're worse than your typical lost person that doesn't know anything. You've learned a lot of things, and you're still lost. And you're pretending to be Christians when you're not. 2 Corinthians 10.7 is another one. It's 1 Corinthians 10.7. It says, Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is in Christ, even so are we in Christ. If any man says he's a Christian, let him think this again. Think about it. Are you a Christian? There are a lot of people who claim to be Christians nowadays who aren't. And that is so sad. They need to think about it. And they need to have someone pressure them and ask them, Hey man, are you saved? How'd you get saved? Why are you saved? What are you trusting in to get you to heaven? Really? Really? Are you really saved? My dad used to always say it's very easy to find out if a person's saved by just asking him one question. He said, you look at him in the face and you said, what if you were to die right now and stand eyeball to eyeball with Jesus Christ? And he were to say, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? He said, usually, not always, but usually by their answer, you can tell if they're saved or not. And some people say, well, I go to church and I'm a good person and I got baptized and I'm doing the best I can. So I guess I need to go to heaven. My dad say, nah, eh, he'd go, eh, you're not saved. And they'd be like, what? And then he'd say, well, let me show you some Bible verses. So if someone starts out by saying, well, I, 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 then they're not saved. Because they're trusting in something they did. My dad would then say, you know what I would say? He'd say, what? He'd say two words, the blood. And God, if Jesus Christ were to ask me, why should I let you into heaven? I'd say, the blood. That's the only way I can go is based upon what Jesus did for me on the cross. Either he paid for my sins with his own blood and I'm saved because I trust what he did. Or he didn't. If he didn't, I'm going to hell anyway, so I might as well enjoy life. I might as well believe it, because at least that gives me purpose. I'm living for him, not for myself. But you see, that did take place. That is the truth. 
And I know that that's the only way to happen. Do you know? Do you know that you know that you know that you're saved? You have a, people out there today that say, Oh, how dare you ask me my testimony? How dare you? I, think, I call it the how dare you demon. <laughs> if you ask someone <laughs> and ask them to give you your testimony, and they don't want to give it, and they get upset and say something like, How dare you? Um, there's a problem there. And they need to get right with God because either they're not saved or if they are, they're living wrong. I don't see how anyone that, that's saved could not want to tell people about how they got saved. How could you not want to talk about what Jesus did for you if you're saved? But a lot of people make a vain religious prayer with their mouth and they think they're Christians and they're not. I've got a gospel tract over here by Bob Jones Sr., might be familiar with Bob Jones University. Well, Bob Jones Sr. Um, preached a message in about 1940s. And it, the gospel track is basically the message he preached. And in that message, he says, I don't believe that 50% of the people that I've seen <laughs> sitting in churches listening to me preach, he says, I don't reckon that even 50% of them were saved. Ah, oh, sad. In 1940-something. In 1940, Bob Jones said 50% of all people sitting in church pews were lost. Can you imagine? Well, here we are in 2014. I wonder what it is now. It might be 2022. Something. What is it, Alex? I don't know. But I know one thing. I've been in the ministry long enough to know that not everybody sitting in a church pew is saved. So I encourage you, ask people their testimony. And then ask them, does your testimony line up with the Word of God? If it doesn't, it should. I'd sure hate to see somebody go to hell sitting in a church pew their entire life because no one loved them enough to ask them if they were saved and to take the time with them to show them the truth of salvation. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Let's go back to 2 and verse 9 real quick. Paul says, For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail. Look at that. Remember, brethren, brethren, saved people. He said, You remember, saved people, our labor and travail. What did they labor in? They were fellow laborers in the gospel. And he said, laboring day and night, night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. He said he preached to the brethren. He preached to save people. Why is that? Because in the church, there's people that get saved and, and start a church. Well, as the years go by, there's young people that grow up in churches. Those young people need to be saved. So every church that you have, not everyone in that church is saved. There's always going to be lost people, whether it's young people that have been born that grow up in the church, or it's other people that come in, or maybe it's just visitors. So when you have a church, there are lost people. Jesus Christ had 12 disciples, and one of them was a devil. <laughs> so what is that, like 7 8% of, of his crowd was lost? Why would anyone think that everyone in their church is saved? I've never understood that. In Honduras, everyone there calls someone else their brother. Hola, hermano. Hey, hermano, hermano. Lost people, too drunk, stumbling down the road. Hermano, hermano, which means brother. What's well, one of the reasons when someone says, hey, brother, I don't like to say brother back until I hear their testimony. Because I sure don't want to give someone a false assurance of salvation. Can you imagine giving someone a false assurance of salvation? My dad's testimony, he was going to a church and my dad was lost, and he was seeking and looking for salvation. And one time the pastor stood up and said, Hey, is that that Robert Breaker guy that has that health food store? Man, surely that's a safe person. And my dad said he just, yeah, yeah, and started to be happy because he didn't know if he was saved. And my dad was lost. And that, that words from that man made him feel so good. And for a long time, my dad thought, Well, I'm saved because he said so. I'm not saved because somebody said so. I'm saved because God said so. Don't put your faith in man. I've run into people that tell me, well, I'm saved because Pastor so-and-so had me repeat the prayer, and, and he can't be wrong, and I don't believe he'd lie to me, so I said the prayer, and he said I'm saved because I said the prayer. Well, I'm sorry. If you're trusting in a prayer rather than trusting in what Jesus did for you, you're lost. And yet a man who claims to be a preacher and a soul winner has given you a false assurance of salvation. So here's a question. When did you hear the gospel? When did you believe it? Instead of asking you when you get saved, let me ask you this. When did you get lost? When did you realize that you were lost and on your way to hell? When did God bring the gospel to you? When did you hear it? And when did you accept it? We all need to ask that question, everyone that claims to be a Christian, to see if we're truly saved.
Now, let's go back to chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians. I was hoping to get through the whole chapter on this, on this teaching. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, what was it that they couldn't forbear? We couldn't wait any longer. We thought it'd be good to left at Athens alone. So they left. They wanted to go somewhere with the gospel. They were antsy. They wanted to preach this to others. And sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer into the gospel, in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. So it's not wrong to ask people if they're saved. If the idea is to comfort them, it is a comfort to know you're saved. It is pure hell to not know you're saved. If you claim to be a Christian and you live in fear every night whether you're saved or not, there's no comfort there. I knew a young man once that went to Bible school, same Bible school that I did. And I heard through my wife because he used to write to her before we were married. And, and then I started writing to her and she started writing to me and quit writing him. But she told me, and he lived right next to the Bible school where I went to Bible school. And he'd walk to Bible school every night and go home every night. And he told her, he said, every night I leave Bible school and I start crying. Because I don't know if I'm saved or not. Can you imagine being in Bible school and every night of your life you cry because you don't know if you're saved or not? And the answer he was told, well, if you're lost, he said, he was told by the pastor or assistant pastor or whatever, just repeat the prayer over again. So every night he'd go home crying and just pray, oh God, please save me. He'd feel a little better, go to sleep, wake up, go to work, come back to Bible school, hear some teaching, and then drive, walk home. God, I don't think I'm saved. Oh God, and crying. Oh God, please save me. He said, he said the prayer every night through three years of Bible school. Probably every night of his life before then. Was he saved? Well, if he was saved, why was he saying the prayer over and over again? He had no comfort. He had no assurance. He didn't know. Well, these things are written that you may know. When you're saved, you know it. Being saved is like two things. It's like being married, and it's like being born. Who doesn't know that they're born? <laughs> when you're saved, you're born again. Who doubts that they're born? I don't know anybody. Being married, who doubts that they're married? Is there anybody that just says, well, I don't remember. Did I get married or not? When you're saved, you know you're saved. Why do you know it? Because you go to the gospel. And the gospel tells you that it's all about Christ and what he did. How can you doubt what he did? These people over here that are trying to get saved by works, the reason they doubt is they're always wondering if they did enough. So did I do enough for God to accept it? That's what causes you to doubt. Well, I hope I did enough. When you give up everything you've done, and just trust solely in what Jesus did, then you don't have to worry if it was enough, because Jesus did it, and he said, it is finished. He said, it's done, it's enough, it's all that's necessary. It's for me to die for your sins, and he did it. How can you doubt that Jesus did it? So we need to have the attitude of not looking down on others, and asking their testimony out of spite and meanness, but to try to establish and comfort them. That's why I ask people the testimony. That's why I try to reach people with the gospel. I've been accused of trying to talk people out of their salvation. Is that even possible? I mean, this guy over here, he's saved and he knows it. How can he be talked out of it? Now this guy over here, he's lost. I guess you can talk him out of it. Talk him out of his salvation because he's trying to save himself. But how can you talk someone out of God's salvation? When you're yep. saved and you know it, how can you be talked out of that? The people that don't know it, it's probably because they're not saved. So, hey, you want to accuse me of talking someone out of their salvation? Hey, okay, I'm guilty as, as heck. I'm just as guilty as can be because I don't want people to be saved by themselves. I want them talked out of their salvation. I want them to have God's salvation. All right, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Comfort you concerning your faith. And then the verse continues. There's no period there. There's a semicolon. Verse 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Well, this is an interesting verse. Paul is talking about, in the last two chapters, all the suffering and all the afflictions and all the bad things he's gone through. And then he says that no man should be moved by these afflictions. So what Paul is saying is, don't go by your emotions. So basically, Paul is saying, don't look at what we're going through and get emotional about it. Paul is saying, we've been through a lot of stuff. Don't let that move you. 
All right? Don't look at what we went through and then say, oh, I don't want to go through that, so I'm not going to serve God. He's also saying don't get emotional. Because when you're emotional, you make bad decisions. And Paul is saying don't let it move you. Don't stop serving God because you know bad things will happen. But also don't get so emotional that you get caught up in the moment and do something stupid. Especially now with men having low testosterone levels, they have high estrogen, prolactin, serotonin, whatever it is. They're very emotional. So they fall for these doctrines of devils because it feels right. Oh, this, you need to do works because of this chakra and whatever, or whatever it is. Because they're going based on their emotions. That's what women do. When you talk to a woman that's not guided by a man, she comes to her own conclusions based on her emotions. But when you logically approach a subject like getting saved, it's very logical. You can explain it to her very logically. It's like one plus one equals two. You can't dispute it. That no man should be moved by these afflictions, for you yourself know that we are appointed unto, there unto. Now, Peter, and I don't have time to go there, talks a lot about suffering. He says, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him glorify God on his behalf. There's a lot of suffering that we as Christians must go through. And that's exactly what Paul begins to speak about in verse 4. For verily when you, we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation. We should suffer tribulation. So he said, hey, we already told you that when you're a Christian, you're going to go through some things. Well, yeah, yeah that's, that's what happens to Christians. Now, this verse here has been used by some people lately to teach something that's a little strange. And they may be right, they may be wrong. But we need to make sure when we teach something from the Bible, we don't take something out of context. There are people today that preach, here's the church age, which, which is right. The church age is right after Jesus Christ died. The rapture is what they teach wrong. All right? So here's the millennium of Jesus Christ, the thousand years reign. And there are people today that are preaching about the rapture, that the rapture, there's a, a pre-wrath rapture. So they have the last three and a half years of the tribulation and the first three and a half years of the tribulation, and they say that we are right here, and that we get raptured out over here. Now, this might very well happen in the future. I don't know. But the way that they prove this is by twisting the scriptures. And this is one of the verses they use. Verse 4, For verily, verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation. And they stop right there. And say, see that, see that? That means the Christians are going to go through the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Tribulation, seven years. So they say, see this seven years, it's cut in half, and Christians are going to go through the first three and a half. Because that verse right there says we should suffer persecution. Well, there is a semicolon after that, and the rest of the verse they never read. Because Paul says, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. So this is not a prophetical verse. Paul is saying back here in the church age, we told you that we were going to suffer. We were going to go through some tribulations or some bad times. We were going to suffer for Jesus Christ. And then he tells them, and it came to pass, and you know. So that happened back here. It came to pass. That is not a verse speaking about the future. And I've watched some videos online on YouTube. There's a great big video about a man that teaches today that we're not going to go through the wrath, but the rapture has to be before, before the first three and a half years. And I listened to his arguments, but I just couldn't believe how many were taken out of context. He confused the kingdom of God with the kingdom of heaven. He had that completely, completely messed up. He was taking other verses and not reading all of those verses. So in order to teach this, he had to take many things out of context. And it's interesting that people will actually try to take verse 4, 1 Thessalonians 3, 4, out of context. Suffer is the suffering that they went through back then, and the verse even tells us. Verse 5, For this cause, when I can no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. So the Apostle Paul said, I wanted to know your faith. So that goes back to what I was saying earlier. 
It's not wrong to ask someone their testimony. It's not wrong to ask someone, hey, how'd you get saved? When'd you get saved? What happened? Where'd you go through? Um, what are you trusting in to get you to heaven? You want to know their faith. You want them to know that their faith is in the right thing. You want to be able to call them brother and know that they really are a brother. And yet in many churches today, it's looked down upon if you do that. But that's what Paul did. But now when Timotheus, I'm going to verse 6, came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that you, sh you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Now look what's tied in together, together there. He said, your faith, and then he said, and charity. Hmm, that's quite interesting that those two things are put together. When someone has faith in Jesus Christ, they receive the Holy Spirit of God. All right, this Sunday, I preached a message on being born again, how you receive the Holy Spirit and become a new creature. Now watch this. So when you get the Holy Spirit by faith and you're saved, well, then you should have charity. You should have brotherly love. You should love others. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Well, let me look those up, the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22. Okay, so Galatians, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. Excuse me, Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is, so when a person's saved, he's going to have the fruits of the Spirit. Or he's I used to have them written on my university dorm back in 2016. Five, verse 22, that the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, Kindness. Love, suffering, meekness, Kindness. goodness, faith, and then it says temperance, against there is such there is no law. So love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. So a person that's saved that has these things... It sounds a lot like charity, doesn't it? So a safe person is supposed to be a friendly, nice, caring, ministering individual, helping others. But what are the works of the flesh? Well, here's what the works of the flesh are in verse 19. Galatians 5.19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, and there's 18 of them. If I've, I've written on each one of the words. I've Sexual lavishness. 18 works of the flesh. Which is funny because 18 is 6 plus 6 plus 6. And if you know Revelation, 666 is the number of man, and it's also the number of the beast. So what are the things that are the works of the flesh? The works of the flesh are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, yep. life, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. So... There's a difference between the fruits of the Spirit, which there are nine fruits of the Spirit, and then the 18 works of the flesh. And I say that because I notice this word charity. There's... Some quick maths, like why it could be nine and 18. Divide each, each number by three, you have 666 or 333. The spirit is the one third that we're missing, which is the three, three, three. When Adam and Eve sinned, the spirit left them because they were body, soul, spirit. The spirit left them 0 0.666 number of man. So the spirit is what we're missing, which is 0 0.333. Just something came into my head. There's no charity of the works of the flesh. Now, can a Christian be guilty of the works of the flesh? Yes, because we're still in a fleshly, sinful body. But if someone is a Christian, the Bible says, by your fruits you shall know them, and there's nine fruits of the Spirit. What do you do with a person? Hey, God, Alex. Be a Christian, but doesn't First week of my program. Take a look. The nine fruits of the Spirit. What do you do with someone like that? And what do you do with someone who claims to be a Christian, has no charity, but has Hello. a lot of these? Yeah. Well, I'm not going to call them lost. Maybe they're just cold. That one needs to give me access. Oh, okay. Interesting. So some of the people that I've met are some of the nicest people in the world that are Christians. But then I've met other people that claim to be Christians. They're the most hateful, mean, derogatory, angry, ungodly people. Oh. And they and they treat you like you're garbage. And they lie about you. And you got to wonder, are these people even saved? Where is the faith and charity? And these same people are the ones that are mad at you for asking
fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. From the first week of my program, I put it in there. One of the things they can study. Someone wants to take screenshots. <laughs> I can't free stuff. Robert. Then there's a Bible verse next to it that compares why. For their testimony, after a while, it's it's hard to uh, it's hard to think. Well, that's that's a safe person because you've got to have some of the fruits of the spirit. So if you are a Christian and you claim to be, work on that. Make sure you never have such a bad testimony that people wonder whether you're saved or not by your actions. Uh, we used to go to a church that years ago it split, and after the church split, the new church called itself Charity. <laughs> charity something church and the reason they took that name is because I guess they were insinuating that the church that they used to go to didn't have any of that charity I don't know it just it's interesting though so well, today when I look for churches to preach in and I try to reach people I'm looking for those Christians that show the fruits of the spirit I don't want to be a part of these guys that are so carnal and so wicked and so mean and so hateful and yet try to tell you, oh, I love Jesus and I, I'm a minister. I shy away from that crowd, and you should too. Try to find people that not only preach the word correctly, but try to live correctly. The Bible says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Amen? So it's important to follow the word of God. There's a man one time, a famous old preacher, and he said, a man's morals affect a man's doctrine. So if a man starts out right and then begins to preach wrong, what does that prove? It's probably because his morals went downhill. It's probably because he went from the fruits of the Spirit and he began to do more of the works of the flesh. And you got to wonder if someone like that's even saved to begin with. I don't know. That's why we should ask them. Ask them their tell of testimony. Tell me, where's that in the Bible? Show me when you got lost and when you heard the gospel. So, in verse, uh, verse 7. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. You see, whenever you're going through something as a Christian, you're looking for other Christians, and you need comfort. You need help. You need someone to say, hey, I've been through it. I know what you're going through, and to comfort you. The last thing you need when you're going through things is to go to another Christian and say, brother, I just need some fellowship, and then go, ah, you stir around, around, around and attack you. It's like sticking your finger in a light socket. You know, you go to other Christians to try to find fellowship, to try to find charity, to try to be built up and uplifted and, and, and go through the scriptures and then pick you up. But then you go to other Christians and they do the opposite and they attack you and they lie about you. That just, that hurts. And so Paul is saying, yeah, we were so happy because we were wondering about you. He says in verse 5, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. He said, I hope to goodness that that you don't turn your back on us, and, and all our work was for nothing. And then he found out, oh, we were always greatly desiring to see us, and we also to see you. And so verse 7, Therefore, brother, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. You as a Christian can be a comfort to other Christians. Be a comfort. Don't be a, a, a pain in the butt. Don't be a, somebody that discourages other Christians. I've seen many times in the ministry, and it's so sad, that preachers get in the pulpit, and a lot of times they become little dictators or little popes. And unless you do everything their way, they attack you and put you down. And it discourages people, good Christian people, so much that they just say, forget it. I'm not going to church. If going to church is for this so he can put me down and call me names and tell everyone how evil and awful I am when all I'm trying to do is do right, then I'm not even going to go. There are so many people out there who are true Christians who have been kicked out of churches by mean people following the works of the flesh rather than the fruits of the Spirit. I hope that if you're one of those people that you would come to the cloud church. I hope that you would continue studying the Bible. Don't backslide on God. Don't let what someone else does affect what you do for the Lord. Amen. It took me a long time to learn that. I used to wonder and worry, oh, what are people going to think about me? I don't anymore. I don't care what people think about me. Only thing that matters to me is what does Jesus think of me? Is what I'm doing pleasing Jesus Christ? 
Is Jesus happy with my life? Am I living for him? Am I doing what he wants? Am I ministering to others and trying to comfort and lift them up? Yes, there's a time for a rebuke. Yes, there is a time when someone needs, to, the Bible says, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Yes, there's a time that a person needs to be rebuked, but it must be with long suffering, with charity, doctrine. Don't get in the flesh when talking to people. Always be in the spirit and answer according to the word of God. Eight. For now we live if you stand in the Lord. What a thing to say. Paul says, it all depends on you. Whether we continue is whether or not you continue. No, I don't think he really meant that, but what a thing to say. It was to make them feel like they're necessary, that he needed them. Yes, we as Christians need other Christians. For what things can we render to God again for you? Verse 9. For all the joy wherewith we joy for, the sake, for your sakes before our God. Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your faith face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So he says he prays for them night and day exceedingly. And all he wants is to see their faith and perfect that which is lacking in your faith. He wants fellowship with other Christians. That is such an important thing. <laughs> fellowship. The Bible says iron sharpeneth iron. We went to a conference here a while back, not too far away from here. My wife and I. And what a blessing to meet other Christians and talk to them and see what they're going through and see what God's taught them and and they tell you, well, this and this happened to me. And you say, well, I've been through that, and that happened to me, and God showed me this and this. And you learn from them, and they learn from you, and there's a camaraderie. Camaraderie? What is the word there? There's a fellowship there where you just, oh, man, I'm, someone knows what I'm going through. I'm not alone. What a blessing to know there's someone praying for me. That's part of the Christian life. That's part of the Christian life. Now, <clears throat> verse 11, now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. So Paul says, I pray that God will make that way for fellowship. One of the things here on the cloudchurch.org, there's not much fellowship. This is a guy on a screen talking to you. You can talk back, but I'm not going to hear it. You can contact us if you'd like. We'll do what we can. But um, guess what? There's no face-to-face -face fellowship. That's what you need a church for, a place where a group of Christians can come together and fellowship. And they need to fellowship in the Spirit with the fruits of the Spirit, and not in the flesh. There are many churches, oh, and I've seen them, you've probably seen them too, where fleshly, carnal, wicked people get into high positions in the church and just run it into the ground. And gossip and lie and push people out, and people get hurt and leave and never come back. And It's just a mess. Some of the biggest messes the world's ever seen have been in churches because of people that probably weren't saved. And if they were saved, they weren't walking in the spirit, but in the flesh, and they caused a mess. So charity is the key. Charity key. And Paul even says, let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. How important is charity? 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or as a tinkling cymbal. He says, without charity, I am nothing. In 13, he says, and now by the faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is Charity. Charity, verse 4, suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. There is so much importance as a Christian in having charity and being humble. God did not call you to be a pope. God did not call you to run around and tell everybody where they're wrong. The easiest thing in the world to find is fault with someone else. The hardest thing in the entire world to find is fault in yourself. Everybody's wrong on this and this and this, and you never look at yourself and see where you're wrong. Be humble. Have charity. Put others before yourself, the Bible says. We're almost done with chapter 3. Verse 12 says, And the Lord make you increase and abound in love one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. So to increase and abound in love one to another. And by the way, love and charity are not the same thing. I don't know what's wrong with my marker here. Love and charity are two different things. New versions of the Bible in 1 Corinthians 13 change the word charity to love. Well, love and charity are different. Charity carries with it not only loving somebody, but giving sacrificially. You can practice charity, which is giving of yourself to someone else without loving that person. If you love someone, you'll give to them. There's a difference between love and lust. 
Lust says, what can I get from this person? Love says, what can I give to this person? And by the way, love isn't an emotion. Love is an action. A lot of people today think that love is an emotion. Emotions change. Love is not an emotion. It's an action. Oops, put a Spanish accent on me. It's an emotion. It's not an emotion. It's an action. If you love someone, you show it. For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son. Love is an action, not an emotion. People over here, the works of the flesh, they follow their emotions. They get caught up in the emotions and they become angry or hateful and things like that. But charity is giving sacrificially whether you like the person or not. So there is a difference. New versions of the Bible don't understand. They just change words indiscriminately and ruin everything. So thank God for the King James Bible using charity rather than changing it to love in 1 Corinthians 13. Now, verse 12 ends with a, with a colon, even as we do toward you. And then 13 is a continuation. It says, To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So what is it that Paul says here we need? Holiness. We should live a holy life, as holy as possible. Let every man that nameth the name of Jesus Christ do what? Depart from iniquity. In chapter 4, verse 3, it's just right there. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. When we get to chapter 4 next time, we will look at the will of God. There are several verses that tell us this is the will of God. But what does God want for us? He wants us to be saved. We need to know our testimonies. Ask a testimony. If someone claims to be saved, but no one's ever asked them their testimony and never found out that their testimony doesn't line up the Bible, which means they're not saved, how are we going to get them saved? How are we going to give them the truth unless we ask if they're saved or not? And if they are saved, then guess what? We need to have charity. We need to have love. We need to minister to them. And we need to show them an example. This is how we live. We live a holy life. We do right. We don't wrong others. We're not mean and hateful. We don't follow the works of the flesh. We try to live a holy life, unblameable, doing what God would have us to do. Establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And look how it says, coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The coming of Jesus is tied in with holiness. When Jesus comes, how would you like him to come and to find you living in sin? How would you like it when Jesus comes back if you're living an ungodly Christ, Christian life, doing things you shouldn't do, going to bars and dancing and drinking and smoking and cussing, and you claim to be a Christian. How would you like the Lord to come back and find you like that? Or would you rather be living right, doing right, preaching the gospel, telling people the truth, and showing people, hey, I'm a Christian? You know, a lot of people watch you, and if you're a Christian and you live right, they say, hey, there's something to that person. He's different. I need what he's got. But if you claim to be a Christian and then you're going out and living like everybody else, they're going to say, man, what a hypocrite. He calls himself a Christian and he does that? Do you think you'll ever lead those people to Jesus Christ? I don't think so. Here's the gospel. Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Can you tell me why Jesus died? What did they crucify Jesus for? What crime did he do? Not a one. Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. Why? His testimony, 2,000 years later, was that he never sinned. Now, we as Christians, you're a Christian, you will sin sometimes. But live as holy as you possibly can and show an example like Jesus was so that people will look at you and say, man, that guy, he's, he's different. He's got something that I need. I want to live like that. I'm tired of my sins. Maybe they'll come and ask you, why are you different? And you have a chance to, to lead them to the Lord with the gospel. So we look today at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. A lot of just basic, basic things. It's so great to just have basic stuff in the Bible. This is the first book that Paul wrote, excluding Hebrews, which I personally think he might have written Hebrews first. But this is a good chapter, uh, excuse me, a good verse for Christians who've just gotten saved. For them to read and see just basic things. A person just gets saved. What do they need? They need to know about charity. They need to know about living holy. They need to know about preaching the gospel to other people. So we will continue with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 at a later date. And I hope you're watching this and I hope you're enjoying it. And 
I hope that it's a blessing and encouragement in your life. God bless you. Have a good day. What are you doing? You know, this is recording. I can't hear you, Fedorsky. Oh, no, okay. oh my god. Oh. Yeah, I want to show a video. Okay. Um, yeah, just pause the record. It's this one. It's a clip from the Christ. Was it Passion? Passion of Christ? Yeah. They first took off his clothes, then they took long leather thongs with steel pellets or lead pellets on the end and beat him across the back until he could hardly stand up. Then they put a crown of thorns on his brow and his face was bleeding. And they laughed at him and they spit on him and they mocked him. And with one snap of his finger, 72,000 angels had already drawn their swords ready to come to his rescue and wipe this planet out of existence in the universe. And Jesus said, no, to this end was I born. He wasn't just another revolutionary. He wasn't just another hippie. He was not just another great man. He was God in the flesh. And oh, the ethics that he taught. Never a man spake like that man. When you get hit on one side, he says, turn the other cheek. He never said what to do after that. But he did say, forgive 70 times 7. Count that up. Jesus taught that we're to forgive. He taught a revolution in the way we're to live. He taught us that it wasn't just our outward actions that God judges, but it's the inward thoughts and intents. And he dragged and lifted and hauled that cross. He didn't squirm, he didn't yell, he didn't scream. He just took it and said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When he died on that cross, they nailed him. They put the nails in his hands. And you know what he said? Forgive them. They know not what they do. Forgive them. Could you forgive somebody that's putting nails in your hands and you know you didn't deserve it? Then look at the death he died. Did ever a man die like Jesus? The lightning flashed and the thunder roared and the earth began to shake. And even the soldiers confess that this must be the Son of God. Any one that can see Jesus on that cross and not be touched has a heart of stone. And then, on the cross, he said, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he dropped his head and said, it's finished. What did he mean? He meant your plan of salvation was finished.
God can now forgive you of all your sins because Jesus had finished God's plan for your salvation. Because you see, God knows every one of you by name. He has the hands of your head numbered. Oh, but I go to church every Sunday. This is what it took. What do you think of that? It makes you realize <laughs> you're shocked. No, it doesn't get old when you see it again. Yeah. And just to give you a reference, I remember because that clip comes from the movie Passion of Christ. I remember when I watched that movie. The day of, the night of, I had a dream. It was very consistent of, that doesn't even showcase any of I, the torture he had to go through. Just think about it this way. In the Old Testament, you blaspheme God. You said, oh my God, you'd, you would get killed. You'd be stoned to death for that. And God and Jesus was going around claiming to be God, going into synagogues. He's doing the worst of the worst because he was doing everything opposite. Imagine how much they tortured him. That, that's the standard. And people yet like to believe they can do it based on their own works. So yeah, do you have anything to add? Because it's still recording. It's very, it's very clear cut. You can't get yourself to heaven. You're wasting your time if you think you're gonna go on on a Sunday and repeat prayers, and then you still don't even know God. Like if that's not enough for you to realize what you're doing is not the right thing, nothing will be. When you and it's like unless you read the gospel and you really understand, I can only speak from personal experience. That that was it for me. I had my little Kindle Paperwhite in my university dorm in the fall of 2016, and I started going through the New Testament. And when I saw what they did to Christ, that no one really had taught me. When I sat there and I read that. And I recognized that I was a sinner and I cried and I called out and I accepted him. That was it. You, you don't forget that. You don't forget your testimony. And it's what Robert Breaker said throughout the video. If you cannot recall when you accepted Christ, you're not saved. You ask most guys, you know, what was it like on your 18th birthday? They'll tell you your first girlfriend, your first kiss. Guys will remember that when you met your future spouse. When you hit a milestone in your business or a PR on your workout, but they don't remember that about Christ, but they call themselves a Christian. That should make you start thinking. What's more important? If you're not seeking God first, you are living a lie. Yeah. And like Rob, Robert Bricker was saying, it comes from a point of back then you can just introduce the gospel. But now there's like religious people that believe in their own works. They have a false God. And it's just unlearning, unlearning. So yeah, that's everything from my end. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode. We'll be back next week on the next verse. Anything you want to say? I said my piece. You have yeah. to study scripture yourself. Adios. <laughs>